thanks for <laughs> thanks Kazuya for having me here. Um, so yes, um, so this talk will be about brains and it will be about brain uh, structure. That's that's been my favorite topic for the past uh, ten years or so. Um, and I will uh, provide an overview of what we know about how bilingualism affects the structure of the brain, and also I will provide a theoretical suggestion of how all this evidence makes sense or doesn't make sense. So um, those of us that are crazy enough to still work on bilingualism and brain structure know that there's a lot of evidence uh, available now telling us that speaking one uh, more than one language has structural effects on the brain, right? So there's nothing about function in my talk. I'll just repeat that now. Um, however, well, there is a lot of results, right? So there's something about 50 or 60 studies that are available since 2004. Or I think it was the first one. There's huge variability in the results, in what has been reported. So this picture here looks like a picture from an anatomy book on the brain, but no, this just shows you all the bits of the brain that have been reported to be affected by bilingualism in different studies. Practically the entire left hemisphere and pretty much everything that's subcortical as well in different studies, right? To ensure we're on the same page, most of this, of all, all these findings actually are on the gray matter, which is the surface of the brain, which is all where you see all the cell bodies, the, 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 the bodies of the neurons where all the processing takes place. That's very simplistic, obviously. And there's another set of results that tell, talks about changes in the white matter, right? So, which is right inside the brain. And uh, these are the, the axons of the neurons which provide connectivity between uh, brain regions, right? So that was the crash course on brain art. So. The challenge for me since I started working on this is to understand why we have this variability and whether this variability can be explained by something. And that something that I focused on was how experienced by or multilinguals are in using and switching between their multiple languages. So this question, this issue was not addressed in the very early studies and I am also guilty of that myself because those studies just took people that you know, declared being bilinguals, compared them to monolinguals, and then published the results. But these bilinguals could have been late, could have been early, could have been immersed, could have been very proficient, could have been of low proficiency, could be whatever you wanted, right? So all these existing studies have presented data from all these very, very, very different groups. So if this restructuring depends on the quantity and or the quality of the bilingual experience, and we will come to that, can we describe the underlying mechanisms that create, that lead to this uh, restructuring? And can we predict the trajectory of these effects, which is even more important to understand? So that was the challenge. Can we provide a comprehensive, co comprehensive theory that accounts for uh, all this evidence that is simply quite uh, conflicting? So what I will do now is uh, provide you with a quick overview of the evidence that we have. And I have separated the evidence in a way that's, that was convenient to me, but also in a way that I think makes sense. So when you look at sequential bilinguals of, highly proficient, of highly, uh, high proficiency uh, with uh, no immersion or limited immersion in a country that speaks the second language, in these sort of bilinguals, when you compare them to monolinguals, you find increases in the gray matter in the cortex, uh, in the volume of the gray matter or the thickness of the gray matter but you don't find any significant effects in the white matter, right? The underlying tissue. Um, similar effects, this is quite interesting actually, are found uh, in simultaneous bilinguals that start learning a third language later in life, right? So sequential learners of a third language. So these are findings uh, that pertain to sequential learners only. Every time you see an exclamation mark, it's one of those uh, findings, it's what I call them, what the hell? findings that make me start thinking about this model that I'm presenting. So if you go back to the earlier studies, simultaneous bilinguals seem to pattern very well with sequential bilinguals, but only the immersed ones. The experienced bilinguals, those, those people that have spent some time in a country that speaks the second language, right? So when you compare simultaneous to monolinguals and uh, immersed sequential bilinguals to monolinguals, you get similar effects pretty much nothing when it comes to the cortex, or very little effects on the gray matter of the cortex, but increases in subcortical volumes and the cerebellum in these 
experienced groups, and also increased in credit in, in integrity in white matter, and especially in white matter tracks related to language processing. Okay? So, non experienced bilinguals, gray matter effects, cortical gray matter effects, experienced bilinguals, subcortical gray matter effects, and white matter effects. When it comes to children now, the literature is much, much, much smaller, pretty much all you see here when it comes to, stress, to uh, brain structure. Um, it has been reported that simultaneous uh, versus sequential bilingual children have increased white matter uh, integrity. So more white matter will come to what more means. And then the same measure changed in say, sequential bilingual children only after they test them again in three years' time. So that's the only longitudinal study that looked at bilingual children, how brain structure develops. Uh, other people like Arkela Suerte found thinner frontal and temporal cortex and higher gray matter volume in putamen, that's subcortical, right? So thinner cortical, uh, thicker subcortical in bilingual children with balanced proficiency in the two languages when compared to those with unbalanced ones. Uh, Thieb et al. found no volumetric differences in the inferior frontal gyrus between immersed bilingual children and monolingual controls, right? So this is immersed people again. This goes back to what we found for immersed bilinguals, no gray matter effects, even in children. I have just snuck in this slide today because I produced these graphs this morning. I'm very proud of them. Oh. This is what I'm working on now. So don't challenge me too much. I'm just trying to understand. Uh, but what, what we see here is I'm working with a large database, about 700 children and adolescents now. Uh, approximately a quarter of them are bilinguals. And what we find is that bilingualism slows down typical cortical thing. We know that as we develop, that our cortex gets thinner and thinner and thinner. It's a very well-known developmental effect, right? There's nothing we can do about it. However, so you see uh, cortical thickness on this axis, and then you see age on this axis. And we have ages from the 3 all the way to 21. Two structures here, superior from the gyrus and inferior from the gyrus, pars orbitalis. Blue line. Um, Sorry, red line is monolinguals, so this is the thinning, it gets thinner as you get older. And blue line is bilinguals. And you can see that in both cases, the thinning gets slower after, well, at around teenage years, right? And this effect is significant in both of these structures. So there is something happening. I said, don't ask me about this, I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> Going back to older adults now. We have evidence for increased white matter integrity for all the bilinguals compared to age matched monolinguals. This is what we find in young immersed bilinguals, white matter, that's fine. However, at the same time, we find evidence for higher gray matter in uh, older bilinguals, in temporal regions, the frontal regions, and the cingulate cortex, in the hippocampus, which is an effect that you don't see in those young immersed bilinguals, right? So, again, these people, older adults, have been immersed in a bilingual environment. They've been there forever. Young people don't show gray matter effects if they're immersed. Why do older people show gray matter effects? That's another what on earth finding. Similar findings were presented in patients with mild uh, cognitive impairment very uh, recently, actually. And then I come to my favorite group. I have a love and hate relationship with this group because nothing makes sense when you look at the brains, or does it? So compared to multilingual controls, people that speak the same number of languages as our interpreters, and the interpreters show reduced gray matter volume in the usual regions, frontal and uh, cingulate, and also reduced integrity in the corpus callosum, a major white matter tract. When you look at interpreter training, so these are all professionals, right? These are all trained interpreters. When you look at interpreter training, the studies that have done this, longitudinal studies, have shown uh, temporal increases in cortical thickness in parietal and temporal regions of the brain, and also increases in structural connectivity between these regions and the basal ganglia, subcortical regions, and the cerebellum. And what I mean, increased structural connectivity, I mean uh, more white matter. Yeah? Then I will finish with longitudinal studies, and you might wonder, I mean, okay. If you care about how the brain changes, why don't you test someone longitudinally? Fair enough. So what we have, and most of the studies we have, have used vocabulary uh, learning. 
So these have been in, in, uh, in, in foreign language learned classes, several countries, including Japan, actually. And what they found after a period of uh, uh, training is gray matter increases in parietal, frontal, and uh, the cingulate regions. Uh, all these regions are related to vocabulary acquisition. We know that they, un they undertake vocabulary acquisition and also language control. And also there's some evidence for increased white matter, white matter integrity after very long periods of training. And not only that, the Hosoda study showed that if you stop your training, and also if you stop using your L2, and you come back in a year's time, any increase, increases in white matter you had disappear. So it's gone. You back baseline. All this effort for nothing. <laughs> right? As I said, these were all training studies. What we did a few years ago, and I'm still quite surprised they gave us the scanner to do that, is we brought back some people we had scanned for, for an older project and scanned them again after three years, all bilinguals, all living in the UK. This wasn't a longitudinal study based on a train uh, a protocol, right? They did nothing in these three years. These were people that were just living in the UK, using English as a second language because they had to survive, they had to work, they had friends, they had family, right? But nothing else intervened. No language training, no extra language training, nothing, right? So what we found after three years, still changes, volumetric increases in the cerebellum, contractions in the codex, subcortical structures, and also decreases in white matter, in frontal white matter. That was after three years of them doing nothing in particular, right? And now they what on earth? Fine. The only thing this tells us is any effects on bilingualism on the brain are not static. They are changing, they are dynamic. Something happens if you use it, that is, right? So this is a very complicated recap, which I'm not gonna go through in detail because there's a lot of information. All you need to remember is that cortical gray matter shows increases in people that are less experienced in using the language. They might be highly proficient, but they're not everyday users. Whereas subcortical gray matter and white matter pattern very well together, and all the effects that you find are in experience by inputs. Okay, so, enough with that. What do all these things mean? Why does the structure of the brain change? Well, changes in the volume of the gray matter, or the density, or the thickness, these are different metrics, it doesn't really matter now which one we're looking at. Um, changes as a result of learning is not a very novel finding. So you might be familiar with studies saying the London taxi drivers have big hippocampi because hippocampus is good for navigation, or there are studies that show that jugglers have better, have a big immortal cortices because of fine coordination, the big cerebellum, and all these things, right? So we've seen that before. The real question is, what do these reductions in gray matter mean, right? Why some of these people show less gray matter? As always, when you don't know What's happening? Who are you gonna call? Monkeys. So, Colotol 2009, they used macaque monkeys and they trained them on how to use a new tool, a kind of rake, which they had to use if they were to grab food, otherwise they would starve, right? So, the monkeys had to learn how to do this, and they did. So, as they were learning, these people observed volumetric increases in the gray matter, right? During this training. Fine, fine. Especially in mortal, mortal areas. However, after a while, with continuous training, some of these regions that had expanded started shrinking again and went back to almost baseline, right? Importantly, the monkeys did not forget how to use the rake. So the skill was there. It was the initial inflation of these parts of the brain that disappeared, meaning that this volumetric increase in the gray matter was only a stage in skill learning, right? There are several theories to explain this. One is by Leuven, which I also subscribe to. Uh, this is the expansion partial renormalization hypothesis. So learning of a skill leads to local generation of new spines, new uh, bits around the neuron that provide more connectivity to other neurons in this part of the brain that's uh, crucial to this skill, right? So the more spines you have, the more pathways you have compared to the stage you were before you started your training, meaning that 
the brain will now look for the, more, the most efficient circuits to use in order for you to acquire the skill and keep on using this skill, right? Which means more spines, more volume. At, the, at some point, the brain will decide, okay, I found the pathway that I like. This does the trick. Everything that's around it will just get eliminated because the brain does not want to have to support all these connections that consume energy, so on and so forth. So the next step is pruning. The more efficient connections, the most efficient connections, networks, have been identified, they are kept alive, they are kept busy, and the rest just go. That explains why you have the initial increase and then go back to baseline. You're back to baseline, but your baseline is not the same baseline that it was before training, right? It's an efficient baseline, if you call it baseline. What happens with white matter? Um, according to Fields, consolidation of information requires oh, okay. um, concurrent firing of related neurons. And this um, continuous and intensive neural activity can lead to increased myelination. Myelination is a dynamic process, so that means more myelin. Myelin is the substance that makes the white matter white. Right? It's a substance that wraps itself around the axons to provide insulation. And this insulation makes communication very efficient. So myelination is the increase of this insulation, right? The reinforcement of the white matter. So myelination is a dynamic process that is stimulated by and regulated by uh, neural activity. And that happens throughout your life. This doesn't stop, right? It's experience dependent, <coughs> obviously. And it's one of the main factors that underlies uh, increases in white matter. Neural activity not only influences the formation of the myelin, but also influences the maintenance of the myelin, see? So it increases the myelin, the more uh, demands you have in the system, but these demands themselves keep the level of myelin going, right? So this explains why you have increases in white matter. When it comes, what, when it comes to reductions, it's less clear. Uh, it would indicate that you've achieved maximum uh, efficiency in this particular network, so you don't want any more myelin, or you don't even need the one you had, or that this track becomes less relevant, or becomes underused for the particular uh, function, right? It's not very clear. Wrapping up together all these uh, learning theories, learning the brain, and also all the evidence that we have on bilingualism and the brain, my question was, is bilingualism an experience, and is it a sort of experience, is, is it a form of continuous long-term training, right? It is dynamic, the effects are dynamic. Is it because the experience itself is dynamic? Learning and using the language imposes quite actively constant learning needs. You always learn, especially when it comes to vocabulary. I don't know if you reach a point that you never learn new words in your second language. You always learn, right? But also, the more you learn, the more things there are there to compete against each other. So the more you know about your second language, the more you need to control your first language, right? We all know, it, it's, it's well known psycholinguistics that both languages are active and compete. So the better you become your language, the more semantic, phonological, grammatical alternatives you have to control. So putting everything together, I came up with what I call the dynamic restructuring model for DRM, which I think uh, encapsulates all the evidence that we saw at the beginning that looked quite contradicting. So it seems like at initial exposure, when you start first start learning the language, or you know the language, but you haven't really started using it in your everyday life, the effects that you find are what we what we described already, right? The effects in the in the gray matter, in cortical regions related to vocabulary, semantic, phonological learning, and then as you become a bit more um, uh, experience using the language, or you learn more things about the language, then you get increases in structures of the brain that uh, undertake a uh, grammatical stage, right? Because, again, as I said, you're not experienced in doing this yet. And this covers for gray matter findings on all the groups with limited experience of everyday use of the language. The second stage are called the consolidation stage. So with increased immersion experience, the weight shifts from acquisition to language control. As we said, you always acquire things, but the more you acquire, the more you need to control, right? So when it comes to gray matter, 
This leads to cortical gray matter reduction, which keeps only the efficient connection. So that's the pronin we talked about in all the learning theories. So initially, with gray matter increases, people that were here before being exposed to the kind of assisted second language, they are exposed now. So they don't need all this extra volume. So pruning takes place. And that explains why immersed bilinguals and why sequential bilinguals don't differ to monolinguals when it comes to gray matter. Right? So the system remains, optimi remains optimized. So you have uh, pruning. Something is left. What is left is very efficient. That's why you can still learn things and quite easily. And it seems that these efficient local connections are the ones that resist age-related deterioration, so two minutes. Um, so these are the same regions that decline at a slower rate where you're an aging bilingual, right? So you create very efficient connections that, that just resist aging. Uh, the same group shows increases in subcortical structures that deliver cognitive control, the basal ganglia and the thalamus, right? It's all about control now. Similarly, as we said, this is the group, these are the people that show effects in the white matter. So continuous usage requires constant communication between, between brain regions to deliver uh, better control. And the third stage in, in the model, which is the less well specified, simply because not a lot of people have looked at very, very experienced uh, bilinguals when it comes to the brain list. Extensive usage lists maximally efficient connections and then less reliance on frontal networks. So you have all these reductions that I found in my weird longitudinal study, at least in, um, in the frontal cortex. And when it comes to gray matter, any subcortical and cerebral effects pertain on the individual experiences. So this is where it becomes blurry. Because now you're very experienced, and if you're very experienced, there's a huge variability in your experiences. So different types of experience will show different patterns of subcortical uh, restructuring. This is just a schematic representation of the model. Uh, it's the same information, all, but you also see the regions that are affected in more detail. All you need to notice is that you start from this uh, region here at the initial exposure, and the more experienced you become, the effects gradually move towards uh, subcortical structures and the right one. So I won't sum up because I've said those things. I'll just say the take home message is that the available studies only capture different windows of this dynamic continuous experience. I hope I've convinced you that everything can be put together if you look at the experiences of the bilingual. Moving on, we treat bilingualism as a continuous factor. There's a lot of data that we have published or are on the way. There's a lot happening. We are very busy, thank God. Um, so we found that different uh, differential effects of individual experience, cell to immersion, AOA, home use, social use, affect brain structure differently. And also, we know the bilingual experiences, this sort of stuff, predicts hippocampal volume on aging bilinguals. And now we're, what we're looking at, which I'm really excited about, is how experiences affect the concentrations of chemicals in the brain, neurotransmitters, which themselves are markers of restructuring. Right? Um, I won't bore you with details, because I don't have all the details now. Uh, I will just thank you very much.